So uh, we were discussing how we sh what we should consider uh, different cell types and cell states. And um, uh, this was already also discussed this morning, in, um, for example, by, by Dana Pear and, and Gary Nolan. And they ca came up with some interesting, inspiring thoughts. So we d discussed that a little bit further. And um, I'm not sure if it really led anywhere, so it became a really philosophical discussion at some point. And we realized that we have to come up with a kind of working definition that we can use in order to uh, proceed with our uh, uh, more practical tasks like clustering. And I think uh, what, what we realized is that, I mean, one thing is, um, kind of consensus um, that function should play a role so distinct cell types should uh, well we should be able to distinguish them by, by a different function they could be overlapping but in, in some way they should be different um, then also morphology of course that's a classical uh, cl a criterion and we would also like to um, uh, to keep this criterion um, and maybe more to, to our um, uh, task in the human cell atlas, of course, uh, we would like to consider um, a, a cell type as a confined set of molecular constituents. So these could be RNAs or proteins or uh, whatever we would like to measure. Um, so you could, for example, think of a cell type um, as um, a confined manifold in your parameter subspace. So if you have um, n parameters and you have an n-dimensional space and the cells cannot move, so each cell would be a vector in that space and the cells cannot move freely in that space, but they somehow have to be confined. Um, and then, well, you can think of them as an end point or a starting point of the differentiation. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, um, it can, came also up how should we distinguish uh, cell types from cell states. Uh, and here, I think the notion is that um, when we talk about cell states, we rather think of um, uh, uh, more dynamic entities where conversions between cell states uh, are perhaps possible or are possible, um, but not so between cell types. So cell types should also be uh, temporally um, kind of uh, separated. Um, this is, uh, of course, very simple and very basic, but I think it's a working definition, and we have to be aware of all the concerns. For example, if you think of a cell type, then uh, the microenvironment will matter, the context will matter. So what are the cells uh, that a particular cell interacts with, and that might determine its, um, its state or its type. Um, then also the condition, I guess, and uh, the age, the stochasticity um, of gene expression, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are, of course, I mean, factors that we have to have in the back of our mind. Um, and then we also realized that there is heterogeneity across groups and fields. Uh, so people that, were, um, that come from more traditional uh, biology fields, uh, such as evolutionary biology um, or, or immunology, they rather think of cell types uh, more in, in functional terms. Um, for example, uh, classical ontology. So this also determines the use of the cell type, and that should also be considered when we discuss cell types. Um, so we have to go back to these discussions and then adjust our uh, notion of cell type to these discussions. So we should be able to, communi uh, to communicate across fields. So once we uh, agree on what a cell type is, um, then of course, how, we, how do we detect the cell types? And I think here it's important to realize that the human cell atlas will not be only uh, the transcriptome, but there are many potential layers that could also be measured on a single cell uh, uh, level or not, and I just listed a few of them here. Uh, some of them were named. And, and then once we have those uh, multi-modes uh, uh, to classify cell types, um, so uh, then we need to wonder um, when are uh, two cells the same? So this is a very tricky question, and we didn't get too far here. So that, um, of course, I mean, depends on the question. It should be a graded definition, because that depends, for example, on the level that you zoom in. If you, if you zoom out a lot, um, then you might consider, I don't know, um, uh, B cells different from T cells. Uh, but if you zoom in, then you might see different subtypes. So that depends a little bit. Um, this is a hierarchical definition that depends a little bit on the level of resolution that you want to look at. And again, um, we can use classical um, cell ontology as a starting point and then work our way forward. Um, so if you accept that cell types are a kind of a confined set of molecular markers, then we can think of them as, uh, um, as sub-manifolds in our full space, uh, or as density hubs or attractor states, if you want. Um, and then the task of the clustering should be to partition um, these, uh, um, the space into these uh, sub-manifolds, so distinguish these different density hubs that should correspond to cell types. Um, distinguishing between types and states is, of course, not possible without temporal information. You can try to infer it, but you cannot really prove it. 
Um, so once we um, would like to come up with a clustering strategy, um, we need to think about what we would like to achieve. So we want to separate these identity hubs. We want to partition um, uh, manifolds that might be amorphous into different um, sections. Uh, and we also have to think about within cluster variability. So how, for example, do we deal with, with gradients? Um, so, uh, biologically, of course, we would like to separate domains of distinct gene expression because this is, um, I guess, the best criterion that we have for cell types. So, we would like to minimize within cluster variability of gene expression. So, when we think about which clustering strategy to, to choose, we have a number of parameters. Um, so, in order to define how we do benchmarking, how we decide on the clustering strategy, we first need to think about what are the different parameters are that, 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 are, um, that we have to select. So, for example, there is pre-processing. So, um, this was more a topic of the, of the previous session. So, we have to decide on quality control, um, uh, on how to normalize the data, but also how to transform the data, which is relevant for which clustering metric to use. So, do we use the count data? Um, do we log transform the data? How do we how, how do we deal with dropouts and do we remove unwanted variability by any means? Um, and then the next thing is prior dimensional reduction. So once you have the data, you have to decide if you want to work on the expression data directly or you have to, if, if you want to somehow um, uh, project them into a, a, a more lowly dimensional space uh, by, for example, PCA or TSNE. And once you do that, you also have to think about how many of the so to how many dimensions do you reduce and which ones of the dimensions you would like to use. So there's also a decision along this. Um, so you can think of these parameters as, um, um, it doesn't work, doesn't matter, um, as, as a multidimensional space. So each dimension is one of these parameters and then you have to select different points on this dimension. So this defines your sampling space um, where you can uh, try to optimize your clustering strategy. So you have this dimensional reduction that you have to decide on. Then, of course, feature selection. Feature selection is very important. So do you, do you want to, um, to cluster on all genes, or do you want to only look at the variable genes, or do you want to uh, make a supervised guest and only take the genes that you think are important for your biological system? Then very central to the clustering, as I already said, is the clustering metric. So here we also have different choices. Very obvious ones are correlation-based or Euclidean or kernel-based or probability-based um, distance metrics. Um, specifically, it was brought up that we should maybe come up with a more biological metric. So here one suggestion was that we could use an analogy um, to, uh, to phylogeny, where we have kind of a neutral rate of evolution. So it would be maybe useful if we could translate that into um, well, into the gene space, and here it was brought up that maybe the number of expressed genes is a good measure to quantify differences between cell populations, but of course we have to take into account also um, the differences considering uh, the biological and the technical gene expression noise. Um, so this is another dimension to decide on the clustering metric, and then of course we have the clustering strategy. So here there are two main categories, uh, the model-based and the non-model-based clustering, and within the non-model-based clustering there's also different methods, so centroid-based methods like k-means, k-medoids, uh, Fabian has talked about it this morning, um, uh, uh, the density-based method, uh, connectivity or graph-based clustering or distribution-based clustering, and I think here we just have to look out for the methods that are already available. So do we have methods that match each of these categories. Uh, and then we have to decide, um, or then we have to test all these uh, representatives for each of these methods. And then we have to decide on how, to, how we deal with outliers. So do we, for example, do we want outlier-sensitive clustering, or do we want to prune the clusters, or do we want to do iterative clustering? Do we want to consider the outliers, or do we want to throw, throw away the outliers and consider them as artifacts? So then there were more, um, some more diff diffuse or less specific criteria that also in, uh, um, in influence our clustering strategy, such as, for example, uh, would we like to use informative metadata, such as, um, I don't know, data on, on patients, uh, age, um, I don't know, uh, health status, and so on and so forth. I think it's very obvious that we should think about using those. Uh, the question of imputation, so how much imputation should we do? Um, then uh, very central and very important is the integration of modalities. So as I said, um, the idea is um, uh, perhaps to not only use the transcriptome, but also, for example, um, epigenome profiling by a tax seek, and then also spatial transcriptomics, and how do we combine these different modalities. So, for example, do we apply clustering on all these parameters together, or do, do we do it separately and, separately, and then do we try to find a consensus? 
Um, so I think this is also a very important decision point and we, we have to think about, for example, what happens when these different modalities di disagree. So how, how do we proceed? Do we try to, um, to then uh, prioritize one of those or do we try to weigh them or do we try to iterate using one modality as a prior for the other and then iterate? Um, so that was one of the suggest suggestions to do that and iterate as long as they converge. So I think this is a very uh, um, critical question or a very important question that, of course, we haven't found an answer yet. Um, then it was brought up, um, also inspired by, 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 by Gary Nolan's talk, um, that we could use um, a reference and, and supervise by that reference, for example, landmarks, so cell types that we know and for which we potentially have, have bulk data sets, and then we could just cluster the, the, the cells or position the cells in, in relation to that uh, and learn higher resolution. So that would be another approach. And then very importantly, so how could we combine data sets? So first of all, data sets across patients. So should we cluster patients separately or should we merge uh, patient data and then um, make a pan clustering? And how should we combine data sets across a hierarchy of cell types? So should we cluster all the cell, cell types in the human body um, in one go, which is probably not reasonable. So we should probably partition uh, 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 our data along biologically defined boundaries. And then we have to see how much uh, we should increase the resolution in order to still find um, uh, novel information. So this is a bit um, uh, 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 like uh, the suggestion or like, like the way that, that, that Sarah puts it in her presentations, where we can look at a map and we either look at the continents or we zoom in and look at the countries, and then we can further look in. Uh, we can further zoom in and have a look at the villages. Villages. Um, right. So this is the clustering parameters, and then. Um, of course, we have the conditions, so we have different data sets, um, we have sequencing technologies, we have variation sequencing depth, size of the data set, we have the composition of the data set into technical and biological batches, and we have the structure of the data set, meaning gradual changes versus continuous changes, discrete populations versus um, continuous manifolds, and, um, and so on, and the spectrum of group sizes. Um, so um, this we have to test and we have to evaluate our methods, so for this we can look at, at clear-cut criteria such as stability of clusters, um, uh, the cluster separation, and the biological readout. So, uh, of course, we want uh, homogeneous clusters with very little in inter-cluster variability. Um, and, uh, for example, um, uh, we would like to consolidate differences across modes. Um, so this can be validated in different ways. Um, so once we have our parameters and conditions, we need to define a test matrix, so which um, sub compartments of the space to be test, and for this we need to compile um, test data sets. And here, uh, of course, we need on the one hand more continuous data sets that have um, like more gradual changes between the cell types and more discrete data sets. And for this we also have uh, representative data sets available, uh, but probably not sufficient in, uh, in volume. Um, so, for example, uh, bone marrow cells as more continuous ones and, and neural cells, uh, brain cells as more discrete ones. And we can test the dependence on coverage and size, and by, for example, by downsampling. Uh, and we have to test it, of course, for different sequencing technologies. And here, what was also brought up, so most, most specific suggestions were made. So we could, also, for example, use mixtures of cell lines as ground truths. So we could take um, HeLa cells and DS cells and mix them and try to recover that. Of course, we also have known markers that we can use as ground truths such as neuronal markers and hematopoietic markers. We know a lot about this. Uh, for example, also early development, where we have only a few cells, but we kind of understand the differences um, already. Or we could look at stereotypical organisms, such as C. elegans, which has a limited number of cells, and we think that they should all, be, um, should, should all, ha should, should all have a very uh, well-defined um, identity. Um, then we could also try to, um, uh, to benchmark um, by high resolution uh, morphology, so we could try to compare our findings to findings um, obtained by other methods. Um, another suggestion was that we could use, for example, circadian genes or oscillating genes in any way as a validation. Um, uh, another suggestion was that we could create high precision data sets where we measure the for example, a single molecule fish would be a candidate where we measure the levels very precisely and use that to validate. And I think a final good um, a suggestion that was made is that um, the human cell atlas, of course, is work in progress. So maybe we should start with well, a limited version of everything and then um, try to benchmark our methods on the different tissues, on the different methods, and then learn by that and this way iterate the creation of a bigger atlas with better resolution and, and better methods. And I think this is... Uh, what we discussed.
I hope I didn't leave out any important, very important things. Um, so we can move to the questions. Thank you, Dominic. So questions for Dominic about this. Who's going to start? Okay, I'll start. So it feels like, is there a fundamental distinction between how you should analyze data that you consider is composed of cell types and cell states? In other words, the cell types, you would apply a clustering type approach. The cell states, you'd apply maybe more of the sort of trajectory approaches that we're going to hear about in the next session. And should you try and distinguish between those two in the analysis, or we should just apply all methods to all data sets? Yeah, that's, of course, a very good question. I don't have the answer. I think uh, we should apply all methods to all because we also don't know how cell states look like. So maybe they will also be discrete populations in our gene expression space. Maybe we find only very few cells in between, or these cells, they, they are somehow very sensitive and are degraded, and we just don't see them. So I think we have no reason to assume that. I think what, personally, I think what we should do is we should not only look for very discrete manifolds, but we have to somehow resolve also the more amorphous uh, clouds. So we have to try to petition them, and, and them in, in some way. Okay, other questions? Maybe, maybe I can add, sorry, just it doesn't go exactly to that point, but there, there was one sort of um, key point that we, we almost missed when we were talking about cell types and cell states. There was a lot of discussion that maybe we should rewrite definitions based on more mathematical, fully, fully mathematical criteria, and maybe not worry so much about things like, uh, like function. Uh, and uh, actually, we, we sort of got back to sanity a little bit. Uh, Pam Sharma very helpfully said, you know, we, we're coming up not with just definitions for ourselves, but also for the community at large, and they should be really quite consistent with what people have been thinking about for cell types and cell states for a long time. And that was actually really useful for us to reorient and remember that, you know, um, it, it's, this is not just, this, this is really for us to make this data accessible to a broader community. So that was the... the yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Fabian? Sorry, can you? Uh, Fabian, uh, to Munich. How do you plan to uh, annotate uh, uh, clusters that you get, in particular when you sort of rerun the algorithm, maybe substructure, find some additional ones in, in order not to have to do this again and again? You know, for nowadays for, for a paper, of course, you can look into it and sort of say, okay, this is sort of rich for this and this and that, but just as, as maybe some automated way that might be necessary to do for HCA? So I, I didn't acoustically uh, get you it fully. An so annotate your clusters. You want to say, okay, this is uh, because of bulk. I know this is cell type X, Y, Z, yeah. or this is rich yeah. for this particular marker because this has been looked at already in yeah. literature. Yeah. And in particular, when you sort of make another update of the algorithm, of, of whatever you end up doing, not having to do this by hand again. Well, I, I, first of all, I think that's difficult uh, to automize. So I think you have to do it by hand, at least initially. initially. And, and there, I think you have to go back and forth between the methods. Of course, what you want ideally is that you have, that, that you have little gene expression variability within the cluster, so that you can come up with good marker genes for that cluster. And of course, bulk can you inf can inform you on on uh, the identity of these groups. But then, uh, as we have seen by by uh, many uh, beautiful uh, previous studies, um, that there can be heterogeneity that you don't understand. Here you don't know if you talking about substates or subtypes or if this is just fluctuations because they might appear still as discrete spots in your gene expression space. So I think then you have to validate and if your methods get more sensitive you might see higher resolutions and you will have to iter iterate in some way. So I think uh, automation or finding one criterion that solves it all is very difficult. Stan actually had a really important point on, on this question, which is that the taxonomy is only one half of the cell atlas, and the other half is the spatial aspect of this. And the spatial atlas will be informed by the markers that we define from taxonomy. And so in some ways, when we think about taxonomy, one of the goals should also be to sort of define the validation experiment. So what are the best markers that define the clusters that we, we define? That creates an interpretable set of markers that not only can be validated, um, but, uh, but um, can, we, can be used to infer spatial localization. Uh, and Stan kindly volunteered to validate all of our data with high, proof, high throughput uh, fish. <laughs> Other questions? One from Stan. Uh, not the question, but the comment for Fabian's uh, comment. I think that's a really important issue, and it's an issue that we're already facing in, in my lab, where we have large data sets that are very heterogeneous, and we keep redoing the clustering, keep filtering the cells, keep uh, uh, changing parameters. And so every day we have a new clustering, and it's just impossible to manually annotate those clusters, and it's not, that's not going to scale. Uh, 
And so we need to separate the annotation from the clusters and annotation. Now I'm, I'm talking about annotation in terms of cell types, for example. So this is a B cell, this is a T cell. Your annotation has to come with an algorithm that says my annotation of a T cell applies to any cluster that meets these criteria. And then it can be applied automatically and at scale. And, and the annotation must be an object in itself that evolves and that we improve and that you know, we store in GitHub and we work on collectively. Um, and that's totally separate from everything else. And of course, it's going to be wrong and it's going to be, have to be evaluated in its own right and, and uh, um, be this sort of evolving document or set of documents. Okay, if there are no further questions, then let's thank um, Dominic and Raul again.